Well, the new round of tough sanctions against North Korea hits the hermit kingdom, where it really hurts, in the wallet. The sanctions ban about a billion dollars in exports from North Korea, but U.S. officials say these sanctions may not be enough to stop the North Korean threat. The United States will respond based on North Korea's actions. We hope that they don't do anything further. We hope that they stop this reckless activity. We hope we don't have to do anything. But all options have always been on the table and will continue to be on the table. Here with more insight, political foreign affairs correspondent Nahal Tusi. Thank you so much for joining us, Nahal. Thanks for having me. Um, were you surprised when we heard these news, uh, the news about the, the new uh, sanctions? And, and what's the overall impact, especially because it's, it's obviously a global enforcement at this point. It's not just the United States. I wasn't surprised because I know that the U.S. have been working with China and others to try to get this through for several weeks now. And because everybody in the world really is very alarmed about how far the North Koreans have progressed on their nuclear program. Now, the impact could be significant if China and others actually enforce the sanctions. The sanctions are designed to stop North Korea from being able to export iron, coal, lead, and seafood. And if those all work and, and they come together, mm -hmm. that means it's going to lose about a billion of its three billion a year income from exports. That's a huge hit to this kingdom. But, but I'm also curious about the human impact. I'm, I'm curious about who, who, where are these exports going? So where will they, be, where will they stop going to? And also the impact of people in, in North Korea. Well, China is the largest trading partner with this, this very paranoid regime in Pyongyang. And so 90% of its trade is with China. So it's going to be really uh, up to China to enforce these sanctions. How, how big of it was, you know, how big of a deal was it the fact that they got China on board? Because like you said, there was negotiations if, negotiations, if I'm not mistaken, for almost a month to try to get China on board with these sanctions. It's a very big deal. It's big enough that we know at Politico that the U.S. actually held off on announcing plans to go after China on some allegedly unfair tri trade practices just to make sure that this diplomatic deal at the United Nations goes through. Okay. I want to switch gears a little bit because there's been a lot of talk a a about what's going on at the State Department, um, especially when it comes to Russia. And, and there was reports that Congress had allocated additional funds for uh, Secretary of State Rex Tillerson to take on Russia, some of the propaganda that we've been seeing. Um, has he accepted that, that, I guess you could say, allocation? Uh, and if, if not, why? Uh, my understanding is he has not yet asked for that money to be transferred into the State Department's coffers. That's 60 million of the 80 million that we're talking about in total. And that money is likely to expire by September 30th. Uh, if he doesn't ask for it to be transferred. And we're hearing a number of different reasons, everything from, you know, he doesn't like the plans that have been offered to he wants to slim down the State Department's budget in the first place, so why would he ask for more money? But we've also heard that it's partly because um, he wants to do better when it comes to relations with the Russians and that this type of activity on the part of the U.S. might annoy the Russians and might damage that effort. So what is Congress's reaction? Because th this is something that, that it, uh, um, there was quite, quite vocal. Everyone was on board on getting this money to the State Department to take on Russia. And now they're sort of seeing it, at, I guess you could say, at a standstill. Lawmakers are pretty unhappy about this. You've had lawmakers, uh, senators from both sides come out and say, hey, why are you not taking this money? Uh, Elliot Engel, a Republican congressman uh, who has, has written a letter, he's a, a number two person on the House Foreign Affairs Committee, wrote a letter recently uh, to, six, to the Secretary of State saying, you need to take this money, you need to get this, right. this information uh, fighting effort going. Uh, and I, I think we'll see more. I know Lindsey Graham has said he's, he's not understanding why state doesn't want this money. So I think that they're going to continue to get pressure if they don't ask for this money and start to use it. Well, the, and when you, you brought up some of the budgetary constraints, but if I'm not mistaken, he hasn't necessarily filled um, every position in the State Department, so he is saving in other areas. And if, that, if I'm not mistaken, that's why folks were also critical that he didn't take this particular money for that reason. Is that right? Well, the, the State Department has been decimated in a lot of ways. I mean, there are just numerous leadership positions that haven't been filled. And while the Secretary of State says, look, it just takes time, I want to redesign this, I don't see the point of giving somebody a job if they might not have it in a few months, mm -hmm. uh, it looks to many people at the State Department and other parts of the world that uh, state is basically rudderless and that it's really not in charge of U.S. foreign policy. And so all of this is coming together and people feel like maybe he's just not taking this money because he's trying to prove a point that state can function with less money. But others say that that actually will hurt America's standing in the world. Right. All right. Nahal Tusi, thank you so much for clarifying all that. I'm sure we're going to have you back, especially if we see how North Korea reacts to these sanctions. <laughs> Indeed. Thank I'm you. Happy to be back.